So before we start talking about uh, wave optics, which is interference phenomena happening with light waves, let's let's go back to this diagram that we discussed in a previous video that is showing two sources, S1 and S2, producing waves, uh, circular waves. And we have drawn here uh, with red, we have drawn the what we call the antinodal lines. That is the points on that plane where the interference of the waves is constructive. And then we have in black, the lines along which the, the interference is destructive, we call those the nodal lines. So we also have, you see there, the labels, we can label each one of the antinodal lines according to the difference in path length that the two waves will have when they arrive at any point on that line. So that path length difference we denoted it with delta r, and for this line we have delta r equals zero, and which corresponds to a difference in phase of zero, meaning the two waves arrive synchronized any point, at any point on that line. Then we have another line here, uh, antinodal line, that is characterized by delta r equals lambda, and delta phi, difference in phase of 2 pi. Again, the waves are synchronized when they arrive there. And we have other antinodal lines like this one with delta r equals 2 lambda, with delta phi equals 4 pi, and then another one over here uh, corresponding to delta r equals 3 lambda and delta phi equals 6 pi. We also uh, mentioned that the nodal lines are characterized by destructive interference. This uh, first one, first uh, nodal line that we see there adjacent to the antinodal line in the middle has a delta r of lambda divided by 2 which gives uh, that null line a difference in phase between the two waves when they arrive at any point on that black line uh, the difference in phase between the waves is pi which means that the two waves are going to this, uh, interfere destructively other nodal lines for example this one over here has a delta r of 3 lambda over 2 that is an odd multiple of lambda divided by 2 and that gives the, uh, at that nodal line, we have a difference in phase of three pi. Again, an odd multiple of pi. This other nodal line right here has a delta R of five lambda over two and a delta phi of five pi. All right, so every nodal or antinodal line can be label, labeled uh, according to the, the difference in path length and the difference in phase. Now we're going to do an experiment here. So imagine that these uh, waves are surface waves, that are waves that are produced on the surface of water by uh, vibrating at uh, an object at S1 and S2, so producing these circular waves. And we're going to what we're going to do is we're going to put a line of corks here, little corks. We line them up on, on the surface of the water. And what we're interested in is how much these corks are going to be bobbing up and down as the waves arrive to each location. So if we were to do this experiment, you will notice that some corks are going to bob up and down a lot. So what I'm going to do here to represent how much each cork is going to bob up and down, what I'm going to do is in this picture, I'm going to represent the amplitude of the oscillation of the cork at that location at the where the line is. Uh, we're going to represent that with a horizontal line attached to the cork and going to the left. So this cork uh, has a lot of oscillation because notice that it's sitting on an antinodal line. Uh, a cork adjacent to it, just above it, less oscillation, right? One below it, less oscillation. And as you move away from the uh, antinodal line and you're looking at the oscillation or the bobbing up and down motion of the corks closer to the nodal line, you notice that that cork or the corks close to it are not going to oscillate. Those are nodal lines. The waves destroy themselves there. So the surface of the water is not oscillating there. And then as you continue to get closer to another antinodal line, the corks are going to oscillate a lot, less, less, no oscillation on the nodal line. And then again, big oscillation of the corks that are sitting on top of another antinodal line, etc. So if you keep representing this, you will get a pattern that looks something like this. So we can represent the um, 
how much the amplitude of the wave at each one of these locations on that line of quarks, we can represent the amplitude of the wave with a continuous curve, right? A curve that goes over these lines that we just drew there, representing, as I said, how strong is the oscillation that a quark would experience if it was sitting on the surface at that location. So we're going to be, um, this becomes a graph where we're plotting the intensity of the wave. So this is going to be an intensity graph that we're superimposing on this picture of the two waves. Uh, this is going to be an intensity graph where the intensity goes in this direct, the intensity um, axis goes in that direction. And the location along the line is the, in this case, the vertical axis. So in what follows in this chapter, we're going to be looking at all at these intensity graphs. Instead of representing, talking about quarks or anything like that, we're going to be talking about that when two light waves arrive at a particular location on a screen, we're going to draw the intensity of the light at that location. I'm going to, uh, we can also, so these groups of quarks, going back to this analogy with the quarks, the group of quarks that oscillate a lot near this antinodal line that has an m equal to, remember that the m is the number that is mu the multiplying lambda to give you delta r. It's also the number that multiplies 2 pi to give you delta phi. So this antinodal line up there is characterized by m equal 2. The antinodal line below that one is characterized by the number m equal 1. Again, that's the number that multiplies lambda to give you delta r. The antinodal line in the middle is the m equal 0 antinodal line. That's because there's a zero there. And m equal minus one and m equal minus two. So each one, each group of quarks that are oscillating a lot because of the interference of these two waves can be characterized with a number, m, which is an integer. So let me clean up a little bit here. So at each location where the antinodal line intersects the the uh, the quark line, uh, we uh, those points are characterized by this number, m, m which is an integer and again remember that at each one of these locations the difference in phase is m times lambda so m equal 2 gives you delta r equals 2 lambda and the difference in phase at that location is 2 m in this case times 2 pi so m times 2 pi gives you the delta phi for each one of these constructive interference locations So in the language of uh, this chapter where we talk about light, we're going to talk about the brightness. The intensity of the light is what we call the brightness. So in this, in this example that I have here with quarks, we would say that the brightness of the quarks, how much they oscillate at each location, the bright quarks are located on this line at the places where delta R is equal to a multiple of lambda, which also can be said that are the points where the difference in phase is equal to 2 pi times m. These are the constructive interference uh, locations um, for these waves interfering. All right, now we're going to do the same thing, or we're going um, we're going to produce the same situation here, but with light. So how can we do that? So one way to do that would be with take, say, a light bulb, and this light bulb is going to produce light, and light is a wave, so we're going to draw the crest of the light waves as they propagate away from the light bulb, and what we're going to do here is something special. We're going to, say, use a piece of cardboard, and we're going to cut two slits parallel to each other, two slits cut out from this piece of cardboard. So the cardboard is going to block the light, and only yeah, and it's only going to allow the light that passes through these two slits. So as we uh, discussed when talking about Huygens' principle, each one of these slits is going to become a source of light waves. So the top slit is going to produce circular waves that propagate out like this, but the bottom slit is also can be considered a source of waves, and they're also going to propagate in a, a circular manner according to this picture. And then, as we just discussed in the previous slide, the two waves coming from different locations are going to interfere with each other. 
and in some places the waves are going to produce constructive interference at other locations the waves are going to destructively interfere with each other so if we were to put a screen in front of this cardboard with the two slits cut out we will notice that what we see on the screen is not two bright uh, fringes or two bright um, strips you are actually going to see uh, several not just two we're going to discuss in more detail this in the next video but what i want to um, tell you for now is that these bright fringes as we call them these bright uh, stripes on the screen that you will see uh, have to do with the points where the antinodal lines intersect the screen as we just discussed in the previous video each one of these lines if we were to put corks if this was water waves and we put corks on that screen then the corks located on an antinodal line will oscillate a lot and the corks located in a, uh, on a nodal line will not oscillate so what uh, what's going to happen here with light is that some points on the screen are going to be bright they're going to receive a lot of light a lot of the wave the intensity of the light is going to be strong at these locations where the antinodal lines are and there won't be any light at the nodal locations on the screen and so on and so forth so you get a, a pattern of light that has these multiple lines according to the location of the antinodal lines so in in to discuss the math and figure out some uh, locations find uh, equations that describe the locations of these bright lines on the screen and so on we're not going to be working with a, a diagram or a picture as detailed as the one that I'm showing you. We're going to simplify things. So the cardboard with the two slits cut out, we're going to simplify the how we draw it. And we're just going to draw it on profile view. And notice that the two slits just show up as two uh, um, points where the, the this uh, where we interrupt this line. So that's going to be the how we're going to represent the two slits. Now the screen, again, we're not going to give you the whole picture that of what the bright lines look like. Uh, we're going to just give you on the screen, we're going to show you or tell you what is the, give you a picture of the intensity of the light at the different points on the screen. That's what we're going to, this is how we're going to represent this double slit uh, interference for light. Each one of these bright fringes or bright strips of light uh, as we said before, we can label them according to the number, the integer m. m equal 2 is that one, the top one, m equal 1, etc. There's a special name that we're going to be using for these, uh, the bright fringes or the maxima of this pattern. So the one in the middle is going to be called the central maximum. The two on each side are going to call the first order maxima. And we're going to call the other ones next to those we're going to call them the second order maxima so again the one in the middle is the central maximum next to that one those are the first order maxima and the second order maxima now turns out that for light we need um, for light we're going to need that the double slits be very very close together to be able to see an interference pattern on the screen we're going to need the two slits to be very small and very close together. So if we try to represent sort of realistically what the cardboard with the two slits and the screen will look like, well, you will not be able to see the double slits. They will be so tiny, so close together that in, in this kind of representation, you will be able to see it. But um, from this picture, we can, we can um, talk about the different variables that we're going to be using in the equations that follow. So notice that the location of the double slit, where the double slits are supposed to be, which is inside that circle over there, you don't see them, but they're supposed to be in there. In the next slide, we're going to zoom in in that region and see what they look like. But that's where the double slits are. If we draw a dashed line, horizontal dashed line, the point where it touches the screen, we're going to call that point, that's going to be the origin of the coordinate axis that we're going to attach to the screen. So that's the y equals zero point. So this is the y equals zero on the screen. We're going to call that also the middle of the screen. Is the point right in front of the double slit. Now, the fundamental question that we're trying to figure out, I already said this, that the slits are very small for light. The two slits need to be very close together. So 
D, the distance between the slits, is going to be much smaller than the distance to the screen. So um, what is the fundamental question that we're trying to, to solve here or that we're going to tackle? The fundamental question is, where on the screen are the bright fringes? Can we find a mathematical expression that gives us the location on the screen of the bright fringes? That's the question that we're trying to solve. So the points on the screen, some point on the screen P, we're going to characterize the location of that point on the screen by the angle theta. The angle theta that the line that goes from the double slit to that point on the screen, that line makes an angle theta with the horizontal. So the location of that point on the screen is going to be uh, characterized by the angle theta. Knowing theta, we know how high is that point on the screen. Because if you use trigonometry, notice that this is a right angle triangle, then you have that the opposite, y, the y is the coordinate on the screen, y, the opposite side, divided by the adjacent. Notice that the distance between the viewing screen and the double slit is L, so y divided by L should be the tangent of the angle. Tangent is opposite divided by adjacent, which tells you that y, if you solve for y, you get y is equal to L tangent theta. So we can talk about the location on the screen by simply talking about the angle that that line makes with the horizontal. So if we know theta, we know the location on the screen on a, of any particular point on the screen. Some of these points are going to be experiencing constructive interference. Some points are going to experience destructive interference. So the purpose of the next slide is going to be to figure out what are the different angles at which we find bright spots on the screen. We're going to find the angle theta 1 for, uh, for the first order maxima, theta 2, etc. Alright, so now let's take a look at this region. As we said before, the interference for light requires the two slits to be very tiny. So in this picture we can't see the two slits because they're so small. But we're going to zoom in and this is what this slide is showing you. So once we zoom in, well, we see the the two slits represented by a gap, by two gaps, and the screen, we're zooming in here a lot, so the viewing screen is far away, it's far in the distance, okay? So for what we're representing here are the light, is the light, the wave, the light wave that goes from one slit and hits the screen at an angle theta, and that uh, there's also a light wave that comes from the bottom slit and also hits the screen at the same location pretty much making the same angle theta with the horizontal again remember that the two slits are very tiny very close together so these two trajectories are basically parallel to each other not exactly but to a very good approximation these two trajectories even though they cross at the viewing screen the, because the viewing screen is so far away, these two trajectories are basically parallel to each other. Now notice something here. These two waves, when they arrive at the screen, they will have traveled a different distance. Notice that the wave coming from the bottom slit travels an extra amount of distance. The, the extra amount of distance, what you, you, you can see it here as a red line, short red line. This is the extra path length. That the bottom wave has to travel when it has traveled when it arrives to the screen compared to the top wave the wave coming from the top slit so how do we find this delta r and what is the significance well the significance of delta r is uh, very big because delta r is the difference in path length these two waves are going to interfere with each other and whether that, that uh, interference is constructive or destructive depends on how much is delta r. Remember that the difference in path length determines whether the uh, interference is constructive or destructive. All right, so let's focus on finding how much is delta r, this little section that you can see here in red. So um, the distance between the slits, we're going to call it d, and this delta r, the extra distance traveled by the bottom wave, is d sine theta. Let me show you why. So this section, delta r, is this little, this uh, red line at the bottom. That's delta r. Let's draw this triangle below. 
So since the two paths are parallel to each other, we're going to draw a perpendicular line to the bottom path that touches, that goes to the first slit. And that triangle that you're seeing there has a right angle, as you can see there. And it makes an angle theta. So this opposite side of this right angle triangle, the opposite side makes an angle theta with the horizontal. So this angle right there, this small angle there in front of the um, of theta is going to be 90 minus theta, right there, 90 minus theta, because the whole thing is 90, right? And then that implies that since the sum of the angles in a triangle is 180, that implies that this angle over here is again theta, because 90 minus theta plus 90 plus theta gives you 180. So we have figured out that that angle up there is theta. Now, since this is D, which plays the role of hypotenuse of this triangle here, that tells us that the delta R segment that we're looking for is equal to D sine theta. The hypotenuse multiplied by the sine of the angle is the opposite side. So delta R, the difference in path length, is D sine theta. Right here, D sine theta is delta R. Now, if the if we're looking for the location on the screen where the where we find bright fringes, that is constructive interference, we're looking at delta R being equal to M times lambda. That's when we get constructive interference. So we just make those two things equal to each other. So D sine theta equals M lambda. Now notice that I put a subindex M for the theta because this in this equation, M is not just in a number, M is an integer equal to zero, one, two, three, or minus one, minus two, minus three. So there are specific angles for which this equation is satisfied. Those angles, we are, we're going to label them theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, etc. And this equation tells us how much are those angles. The sine of theta sub m can be found by taking m, whatever m might be, 1, 2, 3, etc. m times lambda divided by d gives you the sine of theta sub m. So this is an important equation for the two-slit interference situation. The sine of theta sub m is m lambda over d. Now let's uh, summarize a little bit here. Again, we said when we have some wave that, it, that, goes, uh, that is moving through space and we block that wave and we only allow the light wave, we're focusing this discussion to light, and we only allow light to go through these two slits, we know that the light coming from each slit is going to interfere with the light coming from the other slit and when the light arrives to the screen the intensity is going to vary along the screen and this wavy line represents the intensity of the light when it hits the screen and each point where the light intensity is a maximum can be labeled with a number m m equal to one etc zero for the central one Remember that that M number is related to the difference in path length of the two waves. When they arrive at the screen, they will have traveled a different distance. That different distance, when we're talking about a bright fringe, is equal to M times lambda, difference in phase, 2 pi times M. Now the location, the angle that the line going from the double slit to the screen, to the point in the screen where you find M equal 1 bright fringe, that angle we call a theta one. The y coordinate of that point on the screen we call it y one. Theta two is that angle, and y two is that height. The equation that tells us theta one, theta two, and any theta sub m that you want is the equation sine of theta m equals m lambda over d. Remember that D is the distance between the two slits. And remember that from trigonometry, we know that the tangent of theta sub m would be the opposite, which is y sub m, divided by the adjacent, which is L. So the equation gives us y sub m equals L tangent theta sub m. So the two equations inside the rectangles are the main equations for that apply for the case of interference uh, uh, for the case of two slit interference or double slit technical name double slit interference now 
for light waves, what is usually going to be the case, not always, but usually, lambda, the wavelength, is going to be much smaller than the distance between the two slits. And we also assume in previous slide that D, the distance between the slits, is much smaller than the distance to the viewing screen. So the fact that lambda is much smaller than D tells you that lambda divided by D is much smaller than 1, which means the following thing. It means that the sine of theta sub m is much smaller than 1, right? That's because of the equation sine theta sub m equals m lambda over D. So if m is not a very large number, as long as m is not very large, the sine of theta sub m is going to be a small number. Since the sine of theta sub m is a small number, we, we use what we call the small angle approximation. The small angle approximation says that the sine of an angle in radians, if the angle is small, is approximately equal to the angle in radians. So sine of theta is about the same as theta. Uh, the same, uh, for the same reason, or using the same um, um, equation, you can show that the tangent of theta sub m is also about the same as the angle theta sub m when the angle is small. So these two approximations are called the small angle approximation. And using that, notice that the top equation, the sine of theta sub m, can be replaced with theta sub m on the left-hand side. So theta sub m equals m lambda over d. And the bottom rectangle, in the bottom rectangle, we can replace tangent theta sub m with just theta sub m right here. So instead of y sub m equals L tangent theta sub m, we can, we can write it as L theta sub m, and replacing theta sub m from the top equation into here, we get that y sub m is m L lambda over D for the small angle approximation. All right, uh, we're going to go over some of these equations again in the next video, but I just wanted to give you sort of an overall view of where this comes from uh, beginning with the discussion that we had in the previous chapter about the interference of two sources. All right, see you in the next one.